April was Mental Health Month on Petrus Down Podcast. And you're thinking, wait, hang on a minute, Jazz, we're in May. Why are you telling us about April? Well, I had a stressful month myself, actually. You know, my youngest son was on and off sick and like nothing too serious, thankfully. Like it was antibiotics, it was tonsillitis, it was a couple of bugs, it was a night in A&E. And, you know, it really made me grateful in a way, in the sense that, look, Yes, my son was sick and I hated it and I felt really bad for him and it, it can take your toll when, you're, when your children are not sleeping very well. But it really made me feel bad for parents who had children with chronic illnesses, you know, think, I don't know, leukemia or parents with children who have severe learning disabilities and, and having to care for those children, it really takes its toll on a parent or someone maybe with a child who's got cleft lip and palate feeding issues. Or of course, Nafisa, the little girl in Tanzania that we're supporting, which Protrusive are supporting as a charity to help her raise money to fight her SMA type 1 so she can get genetic therapy. If you're reading my emails, I put a, a donation link there and we're pretty much there to raising enough money to help this little girl. But anyway, going back on topic, it's been a stressful month, which is why this episode has spilled over into May. You know, a few years ago, I probably would have been stressing about this. Like, oh my God, I, it was supposed to be out in April and that would have eaten me alive. But my mindset has shifted a bit. It's, it's a silly little story, actually, in terms of this mindset shift. Okay, the story goes that my son was on a play date. It was like an early afternoon thing. Uh, and children nowadays, they have better social lives than their parents. So uh, after this play date, he had a, a birthday party to go to. So we we're driving my son to the birthday party and we were really late. Like we spent too much time on the play date and we were really late for the birthday party he had to go to. And I hate, I absolutely hate running late. So I was in a stressed state. If you ask me then, Jazz, how do you feel? I'm like, oh my God, I'm so stressed. We're late. Ishan's going to miss everything. The, the cake cutting, everything. He's going to miss it. This is so stressful. And of course, two kids in the car and that can get sometimes quite stressful. So I reached the birthday party and yes, he just about made it for the cake cutting, but he kind of missed the fun part. And as I was uh, going home, I met one of the parents, Lorenzo, and he said to me, oh, Jazz, you know, how are you doing? How come you guys were late? And I said to him, oh, you know what? I had a really stressful journey here. You got, we got carried away at a play day. And oh man, I, I really hate running late. And uh, Lorenzo, uh, he just looked to me, right? And he's like a really nice guy. Someone who you just think is just like always calm and happy, happy-go-lucky. And he looked at me and he smiled and he said, don't stress. That's it. That's all he said. He said, don't, he looked at me like, why are you stressing for? That doesn't sound stressful at all. And that little moment just put things into perspective for me. It reminded me that stress is almost like a choice. Like It's like we choose to stress. And I'm sorry if I've repeated the story and I've told you the story before. And it's not even like a, a major life event, but it was a helpful reminder. Don't stress. Easier said than done. But I took it on board and that's why I chose not to stress about the fact that this episode is late because I know you guys are a forgiving bunch and you guys are the nicest and geekiest dentists in the world. So I know you guys will forgive me. And this episode with Dr. Mara Kwaja will more than make up for it. It's a really big one discussing all things to do with mental health in dentistry. And the biggest takeaway I can give you, and really the protrusive dental pearl for this episode, is to really ask yourself, what are you doing to look after your mental health? Now, we know we should be looking after our physical health, like that's been drummed into us. And we know that mental health services do exist in dentistry when we reach crisis mode. So when there is a crisis, then there are these phone numbers we can call, for example, confidential and people we can reach out to when we're really in crisis mode. But why are we waiting for the crisis to happen before we choose to look after our mental health? So I'm hoping this episode will give you some ideas of things to do, but really you need to really ask yourself, as well as your physical health, what are you doing on a daily, on a weekly and on a monthly basis to look after your your mental health and those around you. That could be your family, that could be your spouse, that could be even your teammates, your work colleagues. And one of the things that this episode focuses on is looking out for our colleagues. Like I do not want to ever lose someone again from suicide. Like I'm so sorry for using the S word, but it's a theme we do cover in this episode because it is getting too much. It is absolutely tragic that there are so many dentists that we all know of who have lost lives in this way. So if there's one contribution this episode has is that if we can start recognizing these signs or or self-help, maybe if you're in a dark place, I want you to really take something away from this episode to look after your mental health. And if there's any way I can ever help, I'm just a DM away. And anyone in our community is just a message away. So hello, Patricia Ranti. I'm Jazz Galanti. And let's listen to what Dr. Marut Kwaja has to say. Dr. Marut Kwaja, welcome to the Petrusa Dental Podcast. How are you? I'm really good. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been great to see your growth over the last few years. And for obviously, I'm going to get you to introduce yourself. But the way I see you is someone who is there to uplift people, to help people, uh, not only in just times of difficulty, but to show up as their best. And this whole thing about building resilience is, is what the vibes I get from you. Uh, and obviously, you're behind Mind Ninja, and we'll talk about that. So just tell us, 
How did you get into this space? Because you're still a clinical dentist uh, a few days a week, but you know, you're, you're, you're pivoting, you're, you're helping the profession in a different way. How did you get into it? And what, what qualifies you to, to speak about these kind of things as a, as a dentist? Yeah, I mean, that's a really great question and a great place to start. So I graduated back in 2010 from King's and prior to that, I didn't really have any mental health challenges, but it got to around 2014, 15. I was in a marriage that um, wasn't going very well. I was going through a divorce that was unexpected. And that was my first period of experiencing depression and burnout. And I was really fortunate, actually, that I didn't feel any sense of taboo in seeking a therapist. So my first port of call was, okay, I feel emotionally unable to manage this. I'm noticing, you know, a roller coaster of emotions. I'm finding it a lot more difficult to focus. And I'm just losing my sense of meaning. Like I don't have that sense of purpose anymore. And so from my Is this something that you think was um, palpable for your nurse? Palpable for those who are uh, around you in, in, in the work environment? I think it's quite easy to hide, to be honest. So I don't think people did notice that I was perhaps more withdrawn. But, you know, I don't think it was massively noticeable. Otherwise, it was just something that I really felt in myself that I was really struggling to make sense of my why. You know, if you don't have that, you know, you don't have well-being. And that's a horrible kind of place to be you've got a bunch of negative emotions and also you're constantly either fast forwarding into the future which feels like a really anxious place or you're time traveling to the past and you're ruminating about sorts and chewing over events and so your mind is just so busy with all this chatter so it was a really difficult space to be comfortable with who I was and like I said prior to that I'm a really sociable person I have a lot of positive emotions I experience, you know, I'm very uh, grateful. And so it was quite jarring, to be honest, and then also not knowing what to do. You know, I, I had friends, I had family to fall back on, but that's not enough. And so for me, it was, okay, what can I do? Who, which professional can help me? And in, in my head, it was like, okay, I'm going to go see a psychotherapist. And I didn't go via the NHS route. I actually went privately because I wanted to be seen ASAP. So I booked um, my sessions. Can and- I just stop you there? And I, I hate to inject, but I think this, I want to pick apart some, some things yeah. there. So it's great that you had this amazing self-awareness which I, I, I wish upon anyone. So that's, that's amazing that you had that, I think. And to seek out the right type of professional and to actually go for it. What advice would you give to someone who perhaps uh, feels like it is a taboo to seek advice for this kind of stuff, who might be embarrassed or uh, in denial? Uh, I'm sure you'll probably mention it, actually, but you know, a lot of people may think that I, I should get, uh, even maybe uh, b- taking a step back, if you don't mind me asking, and please, if you want to reject this question, you can do. Like, when you were having a difficult time in your relationship, did you consider, did you have relationship sort of counselling and that kind of stuff? Yeah, so actually I wanted to, my first port of call with the marriage was to get relationship uh, therapy and counselling, but my partner didn't want it. So if your partner doesn't want therapy, it's just not going to happen, right? So, uh, you know, that that wasn't on the table for me. Yes, you're right, there is a big, big taboo. Um, And the way I like to think about it is, look, if we've got a physical problem with our physical body, you know, we've got pain somewhere on our leg, we might see back a physical pain. therapist, back pain. That's a common one. <laughs> exactly, that's a really common one. You know, we might go see a doctor if we, you know, notice that we're dizzy, etc. Yeah, so we're going to see a professional for our physical health. It's the same thing with our mental well-being and mental health. It's you know, I think we need to normalise that it's okay to seek a professional. And the way I think about it is they're ones who, these professionals actually have the psychological tools, they've got the tools and strategies that can help you thrive, right? Help you get to a place of not only, you know, not feeling depressed and feeling, you know, less anxious, but actually going beyond that, feeling a bit more resilient, getting back to those happiness levels. And they've got those tools and strategies. So why not, you know, actually seek them? And actually, it's not just benefiting you, of course, it's got this beautiful 360 degree benefit where you're actually helping your children, you're helping your relationships, you're helping your work colleagues with that knowledge, and you can pass those on. And in fact, I really feel that the tools that we learn in therapy need to be accessible to all of us because, of course, not everyone can afford therapy. But if we make it accessible to children, for example, at school level, 
or you know through our undergraduate curriculum or postgraduate training which is essentially why I created my ninja in the first place it's those tools that we kind of leave at crisis point or why don't we actually gain access to them much earlier on they're so much easier to work through in that period when you're feeling more content than when you are depressed or anxious or suicidal, right? It's much mm-hmm. harder to learn a skill of mindfulness when you've got suicidal thoughts in, in your mind, right? The, the way I see this, Mark, and I love what you're saying, is, um, I mean, recently, it's been the last four months, so I've been uh, using the, uh, an app called Balance for meditation. Absolutely in love with it. I, I bought the lifetime subscription, and it's just five minutes a day, and something I have never done before, meditation. I've started to do it now. And you, you get to select your goals, and I selected, yeah, reduce stress. And it keeps mentioning to me, okay, I know you want to reduce stress, so let's do this today mm-hmm. it's helped me massively because uh, things can get very stressful in life as a father as a businessman a, a dentist that kind of stuff so it can get very stressful and this has helped me and and so i i'm really glad i discovered this and i took this plunge and i stepped into it because i like to work out i like to do my physical health and that's uh, look after looking after my physical health but you're totally right what are we doing on a daily or weekly basis to look after our mental health maybe i could be doing a bit more for spiritual health but i feel like the meditation overlaps that and that's mm-hmm. an area that i have neglected but i think just as much as looking after your physical health, mental health, especially for what we do as dentists, mm-hmm. it's so important. And I completely resonate with everything you're saying, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's so, so crucial. It's taking those small actions. And as you know, it has massive compounding effects. So over time, that meditation habit that you're building is going to grow and it's going to help you, you know, increase your sense of focus. Um, so it's not just about stress, you know, when it comes to meditation. So it's focus, feeling more engaged mm-hmm. with your life, more connected to others. You know, this skill of even mindfully listening to our patients and our loved ones and being present. You know, this is mm-hmm. a skill that is slowly being demolished with, you know, social media. You know, attention spans are so different where they used to be. So there's so many benefits. And it's that simple when we ensure that the exhale is slightly longer than the inhale, that triggers the parasympathetic nervous system and it invites this massive host of potential positive emotions. You know, things like gratitude, curiosity, self-compassion. These are really important in not only kind of buffering those stresses, but also helping us feel, you know, more engaged and having that sense of meaning and purpose. So with what you're doing now, with your sort of newfound purpose and all the wonderful things you do, how does that snowball into what you've become now? And what is your mission in terms of uh, how you want to achieve to be able to help uh, as many dental professionals as possible and maybe just generally people? Yeah, absolutely. After that period when I was going through depression um, and I had therapy, I discovered these gorgeous psychological tools and I started thinking more about dentistry and how bizarre it was that, yes, there were crisis point services set up. You know, we've got Confidential, we've got NHS Practitioners Health Support, we've got all of these amazing charities, but there just is zero conversation around clinician well-being. And it's mad. From my perspective, this makes no sense. As a you know dentist, you know, we're taught as a, a student that prevention is better than cure, right? So why don't we answer the same problem, you know, this burnout problem, the suicide problem, but flip it around and actually just give clinicians tools early on. So that's part of it, part of resolving the stats. Of course, it's not everything, but it is a big part. Also, organisational culture is a big part. Those are two really big factors when it comes to those stats, right? And that led me to kind of upskilling. So I had actually done a psychology BSc as a dental student, so I integrated in psych or always been interested in psych, interested in what makes people tick, why people do certain things. And so that led me to then find positive psychology. So this is a specific branch of of psychology that actually focuses on what makes people and organizations flourish. So we're talking about resilience, we're talking about growth mindset, we're talking about strengths, happiness, positive emotions, um, productivity, all of those aspects. And so I ended up doing a master's, which I absolutely loved. And then I trained up as a mindfulness teacher and I'm currently doing a diploma in organizational psych. And so the mission was set up, or I founded My Ninja back in 2019, as a result of just being frustrated by the lack of preventative tools 
and wanting to come up with a solution. So I paired up neuroscience with mindfulness and positive psych. It felt like it needed to have a very science-based grounding that resonates with me and resonates with, I think, dental professionals, which was my niche. And the mission really was, is to help dental professionals across the globe lead happy and healthier lives. And I do this in various ways. I do workshops and programs and products. And I have actually, since last year, thought about broadening out to other niches like medical professionals as well as the general public. And I created a mindfulness toolkit for the general public last year. So I'm, I'm thinking of some other ways I can help organizations. So yeah, that's a really exciting kind of mission. It's something I mention a lot on the, on the podcast, but you, you, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking back and with your psychology, it just, it, it kind of all makes sense. I, you know, I, I love this bit of the journey when I speak to my guests about, okay, why did this person get fascinated with removal pros? Why did this person get fascinated with this element of dentistry? And obviously what you've done is, is outside dentistry, but you're connecting it, you're bringing it all together, which I love. Now, sorry to pivot in a sadder and darker trajectory. And I'm, I'm just publicly thanking you in advance for tr- trying to tackle this, this thing, which I think about a lot, Mark. I, it really worries me, not for myself, right? But for the people we've lost along the way, for, for mentors, for friends and stuff. And, and it's really hurtful. And if this episode from our, even this, you know, the five minutes or, or of chat on this topic before I move on to other topics can, can help a few people, then I think it served its purpose. And it is the, the thing about suicide. Like when I was applying to dental school, you read about dentistry. There was Google back then. And so as well as knowing how much a dentist earns, you also read a few other things. And then one of the things you read about is actually dentistry has got or did at that point had the highest suicidal rate. I heard veterinary sciences are higher and all these things, basically. Well, now that I'm a dentist, now that we're in this space, we kind of see, OK, yeah, you know what? It's a, it's a, it's a very stressful job. Lots of expectations we need to meet and lots of pressures that you put on ourselves, both financial hitting targets, that kind of stuff. And maybe even like there's an element of keeping up with the Joneses, right? And like, oh yeah, I'm a dentist. I need to be driving a nice car. And that itself could be an issue. And then patient complaints. Like, you know, you had this horrible experience with a relationship and and you had the resilience and the self-awareness to seek help. But there are so many dentists out there who last week, last month, were got this dreaded letter and they are in, in crisis mode. And some of these people reach out to me and they use the S word and whatnot. And, and, I, and, I, and I try to reach out. I and mean, one of the reasons I want to record with you is, OK, how can I lead them to help? OK, and then, yeah, there are lots of these crisis things, but I want to talk about prevention uh, as well, like what you can do daily so that when that complaint happens. Right. Come on, guys, we're going to it's going to happen. Right. Let's let's take it shit. When it happens, we can deal with it in a much better frame. So what do you think? based on helping certain people with their, with, you know, just their mind, their well-being, mental well-being, and your experiences as a dentist. What, why do you think there is an issue of suicide within dentistry? Why do we hear about it now and again? It ch- sends us chills down our spines. Well, it's all the factors that you've mentioned and looking at the research that completely supports it. So you've got organisational factors. So the kind of workplace you're at, you know, is it a toxic place? Is there bullying? Is there incivility? And that seems to be quite commonplace because actually, you know, dental principals maybe don't have training in management they're not really aware of how to create the right culture right so you've got the organizational side and in that that might be even how the UDA contract is how it is currently in in its format if you're working in the NHS you've also got you know patient factors so you've got high demanding cases difficult cases you've got anxious patients that's really common you might get aggressive patients you might get complex compassionate care challenges you know if we see patients regularly every three months we're going to see our patients going through divorces going through bereavements going through mental health challenges and that's tough as well so you've got all of those factors as well as the actual personality factors of the individual right so a lot of us might be might have a type a personality so high levels of perfectionism and often that's associated with things like psychological distress. And in fact, there was a study during the pandemic 2020 looking at dental UK dental students, and they reported uh, high incidences of perfectionism, it was like, like 30 something percent. And that's linked to... That, that, I, 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 that surprised me. I thought we weigh more than 30 percent. Like I, I see dentists in a room and restorative dentists, like I thought their perfectionism level would be so, even higher. Yeah. So this was what they called maladaptive perfectionism, which was associated with 
burnout and distress. So it's out of those people that were burnt out. So it's really mm-hmm. high compared to the general population of students. And, you know, so so all of those factors accumulate together. You've got the organisation side of things. You've got the personality factors. And the constant fear, right, of messing up because, I mean, yes, in medicine, if you mess up, then someone could die, right? Mm-hmm. And that itself, I'm sure in medicine, there's all sorts of these issues and they need well-being support and that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. But in dentistry, okay, fair enough, that, that's not likely to happen. But it still hurts us, right? It still hurts us when we take a rubbish impression. It still hurts us when we fail at an extraction and we, we, we ruminate, as you used that word earlier. We think about it and we doubt ourselves. We think we're rubbish. We think we need a career change. Then when you compound on top of that, the argument that you had with a spouse or mm. the, your, your relationship with your child had a hiccup along the way and a toxic relationship, like all these things can, can compound. So I, I guess what we're coming to is, okay, we, we realize that we have a problem in our profession, unfortunately. Where can we even start? And I, I don't expect you to have the, the answer, the, the, the cure. I'm just coming to you as a, someone who's curious because I feel like you're in much better position to, to help everyone than I am. What do we think we can do? So in terms of reducing the suicide rate and burnout rate, is that the question? That, that and I think it may tie in with all the things that you said. Like is there daily practice of well-being, yeah. all the resilience training, so yeah. that when the, the crisis mode happens, we're better able to, to, to adapt to it and, and, and overcome it? And also... What kind of help should we be seeking? Who should we be speaking to? And then I later want to ask you, are there any signs? Uh, you know, imagine you have a colleague that you have worries about and maybe they've said a few things. You know, what, what's our responsibility as a friend, as a colleague? What can we do so that it doesn't end up leading to something bad? Yeah, absolutely. I think there are so many ways we can address this problem. And I think actually what we've been doing so far is not the whole picture. So, so far, what we've done is we've created crisis point services. So like I said, if we're unwell, we can then be signposted to NHS practitioners health support. That's one of them. So we can we don't have to go to our, our GP, for example, to get CBT sessions, therapy sessions. We can actually go through this service. We can call Confidential. We can speak to Dentist Health Support Trust. There's, there's numerous ones. BDA have got hotline as well. So we've got crisis point services set up but what we don't have is any of the preventative stuff really I think you know prior to me starting this there was really very little talk about psychological well-being from my perspective so what we could be doing is in our undergrad curriculum we can have a resilience module right Um, Mm well-being resilience module so we're not only just learning about stress management of course that's important but we're also learning about those important psychological tools to help us feel more resilient and thrive why not even make this like a, a core cpd like yeah we run about radiation there's ions every bloody five years let's also <laughs> learn about resilience and and you know it might actually really help yeah absolutely so you know get that in the undergrad level then have it in postgrad level not just you know your little webinar now and again but i'm talking about programs and this is what i've been doing with my ninja working with organizations we've done you know four week programs and i'm currently doing the nhs pilot resilience program for west midlands and that's both with trainers and trainees so you know there are programs that we can do and get those in then at a team level teams principals should be actually or ideally having a well-being lead ideally having the whole team trained in mental health first aid this course is really accessible. You can book it very easily. And it's a low costing course. And in that course, you're going to learn all the early signs and symptoms of the common mental illnesses, right? And then you're going to learn how to talk to your colleagues in a better way, in a more supportive way. So you actually know how to have these mental health conversations. So, you know, that kind of training is important. Also having annual resilience and wellbeing training for the team is really kind of important. And setting up positive practices for the team. It can be simple as, you know, when you start a team meeting, instead of going into the agenda straight away or talking about things that are not going well, to spotlight things that are going well. So go around your team members sharing moments of gratitude or compliments from patients. You know, these are great ways of building positive emotions. Now, positive emotions are not just feel good factors. They do so much more. We're talking about broadening our resources like resilience, buffering against stress and creating that positive culture 
because happier teams equal more productive teams, more profitable teams. And so, you know, there is a big business case for principles to actually invest in well-being. So there's lots of different ways. Of course, as you said, the CPD is so, so important. The GDC could be doing much more about this. CQC could be doing so much more. They do need to make this a core uh, topic. They will do at some point. Uh, this is a If any of these uh, aforementioned organisations have c- come across this podcast, Let's do something, please. Let's do something. Reach out to, to, to Maruk if she can help you. That would, that would be good. I love the whole well-being lead. I, li- I like the idea. We have a safeguarding lead. I think that's a very simple thing that uh, all institutions uh, can implement totally. So uh, some great ideas there, and, and, and I love it. And I feel like if we can get this message out there, then hopefully we can make an institutional change that will lead to better outcomes in the future. One thing I want to talk about is that inner voice right? That inner voice of anxiety, and this could be like over a procedure or something that's gone wrong or defensive dentistry. For those people who are not sure what defensive dentistry means, that you're, you're really, really trying to be extremely safe. You're taking the easier option that's more, maybe a little bit more predictable, but maybe you might not be the best thing for the patient, maybe, but you know that the, the chance of getting sued for this thing is going to be less. It's like you're constantly covering your tracks. You're writing notes, which are way, they don't need to be that lengthy, but you are. You're staying behind. You're doing all these things. You're, you're constantly thinking. You're, you're not thinking, how can I serve this patient? You're thinking, how can I not get sued for this patient? It's a different mindset. So there's a whole thing about that, about the, how we, our mindset works. So let's say someone gets a horrible thing about getting their complaint. It could be their first complaint, or for example, that's when it probably hurts the most. And that inner voice takes over. What advice could you give to that dentist who is having these sleepless nights at the moment and getting uh, worked up and that inner voice is not in a good place? How can they get back into feeling themselves? Because one thing I love what you mentioned is that when, when teams feel good, they'll be more productive and your bottom line improves. I'm actually reading and listening to uh, Ali Abdal's Feel Good Positivity, right? Uh, and the whole ethos of it is actually you're going to be more pro- feel good productivity. He said, if you're feeling good, that's when you'll be most productive. And so let's focus on how we can feel good. And little things like making sure that when you're working, when you're doing, like you try and do the more procedures, the procedures that you like doing, for example, but put on your favorite music when you're doing it. Like little, it's got, and I'm, I'm trying to formulate a podcast with like uh, extrapolating that book and, and presenting it for the dentist in terms of like little things we can do to make our daily practicing lives better. But, but that's a, a, a different thing. What, what do you think to how we can help that dentist who, who needs help because that inner voice is, is now not in a good place? Yeah, just going back to your Ali Abdul point, so his book is based on positive psych, right? I don't know if you've read The Brawn and Bill does. That's back in chapter one. He's mentioned so much research from positive psych. So, you know, his whole talk about using our strengths, values is such a big thing, meaning. And then obviously injecting fun and pleasure. That play. comes from... I love the word, yeah. the use of play. And I think play. there's not yes. enough play in dentistry. I think the absolutely. happiest dentists are the ones who are playing the most. Yes, yes, absolutely. So I think it's great to see Ali bring PP to the world. Um, which is kind of like my mission as well but going back to the question then so the way I wanted to address this is going uh, is firstly focusing on when you're in that moment and you experience that unhelpful thought pop up so for example it might be I'm going to give you a scenario you're doing a crown prep and you're looking at your margins you're like you notice a thought pop up and it might be like this crown is not going to fit. You're so crap at this. You should be better at this by now. Patient's Mm going to complain. And then before you know it, that sort has gone to the GDC. Like, you know, this isn't going, this is going to be a really bad case, right, for me. So the first step, and I want to really give you practical tools there and, you know, in that moment, what can you do, right? So the first step is just simply noticing that sort and using mindfulness to do this. So mindfulness gives us this tool to be present um, and you want to catch that thought. So you, you, you can say to yourself, I notice I'm having a thought that I'm not good enough, for example, like fill in the blanks, whatever that thought might be. Now, simply putting some psychological distance between you and that thought is really, really powerful because it reminds you that you're not your thoughts that thoughts come and go, that you don't need to buy into the story. And that's the tool of mindfulness. That's what you can gain from it. And what you might want to do is to take a deep breath, a couple of deep breaths, making sure the exhale slightly longer than the inhale and, you know, catch that thought. Say to yourself, I notice I'm having a thought that I'm not good enough. Next, we can use a self-compassion tool. So self-compassion is about giving yourself kindness speaking to yourself in a kinder loving way like you would a friend or a loved one like we do for our children we instinctively know 
how to react with our loved ones, right? So we're just giving the same loving kindness that we show to everyone else in the world to ourselves. So instead of having that critical thought that pops up, replacing it with a kinder voice. And you might say to yourself, look, I, I noticed that you're going through a hard time. Um, I noticed that you're experiencing these thoughts. I've got your back. What do you need right now? How can I help you? Just whatever it might be. It might not be that. Um, that's what I would say to myself. But you just coming up with words right now, it might be that you want to physically soothe yourself. So when we're stressed, we actually have a physiological response, right, to the, that stressor. And that critical thought actually is stress. And so we can buffer it through physical touch. So this sounds a bit weird, but you could do this in the moment, right? You could even squeeze your arm, your hand, something like that. Like that's something really simple that you can do. A I have a really good it. massage gun if anyone wants a recommendation. Like <laughs> it's a spot. But yeah. would that count? <laughs> Uh, probably in the moment you can't do that this is my point so I want to <laughs> yes, give you tools right. that you can do in the moment and that's you know something as small as just putting your hand on your your leg or like on your arm squeezing your arm I just stroke my beard then <laughs> <laughs> just whatever you can do that just brings that sense of calm again and we know from the research that this these little things can work I know they sound a bit it's like bizarre. a trigger that constantly reinforces it right yes yeah exactly mm. so so that's a self-compassion tool. The other tool that's quite useful is cognitive re reframing. So that's uh, thinking of the situation in a different way, in a more helpful way. So you might say to yourself, a more helpful way of thinking about this is that the crown will fit, that I'm going to figure out, I'm going to look at these margins, I'm going to correct this, I'm going to change this. And actually, the worst case scenario isn't going to happen, right? Or, so you or uh, just to add in that, because I, I love what you're saying yeah. here, real practical tools Like you know, you can speak to technicians, say, hey, this is what happened, it's a really tough case, how can we work together to, to make sure that we get a, a good crown fit? So instead of just waiting for to see what turns up, giving yeah. the technician a bit of backstory, hey, this is what happened, can you help me out? How can we rectify this? And they may give some suggestions of, of how to overcome it. Absolutely. So thinking of ways of problem solving, if it, the worst case scenario does happen, right? Like, or if the crown doesn't fit, you know, going so, forward. So top tip, top tip there then. So you know, I, my, my episode is so clinical based. So I, I love bringing this into, into it yes. to, to compound what the wonderful things you're saying is if this happens, uh, then tell the patient, don't say that we're fitting your crown in two weeks time. Say we're going to do a try in. I want to make sure everything's perfect. We're going to check the shade. If it happens to be good that day, we might glue it in, but we're going to book a try-in and then the fit appointment. So it's a good little tip that I learned I'm just passing on. I think it was Govinda Birth that told me years ago about this. And so we do this with all crowns routinely is a good thing to do because, you know, one in 20, one in 30, there's an issue. Patients understand, oh, yeah, this was a try-in anyway. So that's another way you can manage that. Yeah, absolutely. So just to kind of recap on that. So when you're in that moment, when you are noticing you have an unhelpful thought, try mindfulness, try the self-compassion tool or try the cognitive reframing. This isn't an easy thing to do. And I appreciate that. So it's going to take time, like any muscle of the body, right? The muscle of the mind takes a bit of time to build. So keep working at it. And with time, this will become a bit easier. Now, things you can do outside of the clinic, because obviously there's only so much you can do in the moment, right? So outside of the clinic, what you can do is just doubling down on lifestyle factors so we're all aware of this but just ensuring that we have enough sleep we've got sleep hygiene practices in place we're we've, we're eating well so nutritious food rather than ultra processed food right water getting your waters in also things like movement you know simple simple ways of getting more movement it might be going for that morning walk before you start work it could be going for a walk during lunchtime those factors are really really crucial we can also lean into to our relationships and community. And that's really, really important when we're talking about building resilience, right? So if you have people that you can trust and connect with, your loved ones, as well as a community, you'll feel less alone because when you share that thought, for example, in a safe space, right? You, you'll probably find that actually this thought is really common, that a lot of people experience this unhelpful thought and you're not alone in that experience. And once we know that we're not alone, it feels like it's less about us being weird that we're having this thought and we're less judgmental about it, right? So there's that aspect um, when we connect with others and so kind of drawing upon your relationships, but it also could be drawing upon coaches or mentors and that can be really a great way to help us even reframe our language 
which sometimes can be very critical. You know, it might be that we say the crown failed or my crowns fail, you know, having a very fixed mindset that actually whenever I do this specific treatment, it always goes bad, right? And reframing that in a different way, a coach can help you with that, with positive language. And they might, you know, really get you to hone into your progress that actually every time I do this I get better or my failures are the stepping stones for success right I need to be aware of all the obstacles to actually get really good at something and also just to emphasize that clinical dentistry takes time it's not like social media where you've got this perfect you know composite that looks gorgeous and translucent looks like a tooth that is a a skill that has taken a lot of obstacles challenges failures and so you need to have like you said that mindset and we're really talking about gross mindset here a gross compassionate optimistic mindset which are all skills that we can hone into but take time so if we look at Carol Dweck, she's a lead researcher. I was just going to mention her book. In, in, um, in Mindset. So she's a psychologist that actually came up with this term. Now, she studied children. And what she found really interestingly was that there were some kids that had challenges. And they were super excited about the challenge. They were like, I've wanted this to be tough. And then other people would really crumble, right? And they tended to be the ones with a fixed mindset. They believed that their intelligence was fixed, uh, whereas the growth mindset really believed that their intelligence was dynamic, ever-changing, they could grow, and they really honed into neuroplasticity, which is this science that shows that our brains can rewire and change structurally at any age. Now, we didn't know this back, you know, 30 years ago. We actually thought that after a certain age, our brain was quite fixed. But what we know is that, you know, these skills of mindfulness and self-compassion and reframing all of these tools. And, and emotional be- intelligence that, you know, you're not, that's not fixed either. You can raise your EQ as well. Yes, absolutely. And it doesn't matter how resilient you are currently, you can become more resilient. All of these traits are very changeable. We can work on them. They're teachable, which is really epic to know. And, you know, this is kind of exciting for me because, you know, these are skills that we can pass on to our children and we can really help them thrive, right? I mean, that's that, that's so, so current for me. The thing I, I think about the most for my four-year-old is making sure he doesn't get into his fixed mindset. Like, I, I see how he reacts to a challenge. He, he puts a strop on. I really want to change that. Look, you were in a different light. Uh, so so I, I love that. It's something that, you know, it's going to affect our relationships with our, with our loved ones as well. And it's so, so important. It's, it's infectious, all these things you're saying. So if you are in a difficult spot at the moment and you're having these thoughts because maybe you've had a complaint, you know, recognize the thought, you know, step out of your body and look, look at it as a, as, a, as a thing floating in the air. This thought, give yourself some self-love, as Marek said, uh, cognitive reframing. Think about it. Don't think it's going to a GDC. Think, oh, my indemnity is going to try their best because my notes are really good. The tools that Maruk mentioned, exercise, sleep, relationship, there's too many to, to name them. I'll, it will all be in the show notes and the, the PDF and the transcript to, to, to re- re- look at it again. But that's fantastic. Now, in the interest of time, I just want to get to my last question, which I think is huge, right? So this might take us a little chunk of time, but this is absolutely enormous because I think it's, this is so linked to all the three other themes that we talked about today. And it's a toxic work culture. I've had, we've talked about this before. I've interviewed some, some dentists who've been in a toxic work culture at that time. How do you think we can manage it? Because the most sensible thing that I've read online on, on dentists helping other dentists on Facebook groups and stuff is get out, leave. You know, get out, leave. Is that the only way? Is, is it just to flee in a toxic culture? Or should that associate dentist, for example, be putting all that strain to, to and, and time to invest in trying to help this toxic culture. Obviously, it's a huge, big, big little problem without the fine details. But how do you support colleagues when they're in a toxic culture? I'm curious. Yeah, great question. I actually feel that if you're in a toxic workplace, and I've been in multiple toxic workplaces over the 13 years, right? I feel as though it is really important that you leave that practice, leave that environment. You can't outrun a bad toxic workplace, just like with the diet, you can't outrun it. So it's just really important to actually, from my perspective, leave that, that place. Culture is set by management. It's set by the higher up you're not going to be able to change it. Of course, you can try, but I think you need to prioritise your well-being and your happiness. And if you notice simple things like bullying's happening, 
people are being unkind. Which, which Mark happens a lot. I don't know if you experience this, but, but a lot of the messages I get, I'm just reflecting on these. Mm. A lot of young female dentists have told me that their slightly more senior female nurse mm. bullies them. Absolutely. I don't know if you've seen this. I, I've, I've seen this so, so often. Yeah. Absolutely. It's happened to me um, several times but as a new graduate to dentistry. And then other bits, you know, I, I remember having a principal dentist that had a really shaming way of teaching. And so when he had his meetings, he would put pictures up of other people's work. It wasn't my work, but it was colleagues that were so much more experienced than me. And he would ask us to critique that radiograph you know oh there's an overhang there oh the you know the root filling is short mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but it was in such a shaming way that you just really couldn't learn and um, and so you didn't feel psychologically safe to have to raise concerns to be yourself to be authentic so if you notice that there is bullying there is a shaming culture that people are being unkind you're right it's really really common There's no reason for you to stay. There's nothing more important than your health, so please leave. There are times when, obviously, you've got a mortgage to pay. You feel as though you can't actually leave. What I'd say to that is look for other jobs. There are lots of jobs out there. There's lots of really nice... And if you think there aren't, that's a mindset issue. That's a fixed mindset issue. If you think there aren't any other opportunities around and this is the only one they got to stick with, then totally that's a mindset issue, going back to what you said. Uh, And and my wife has been in this scenario. I've been in this scenario uh, Mm -hmm. throughout the many years, many associate positions. Isn't it absolutely liberating? Yes. Like you, you, you work yourself up. You think, how am I going to tell them? You, you spend hours writing that letter. <laughs> and then once it's done, they're like, okay, go. It's like you've broken the shackles. <laughs> it's the best thing. Like, honestly, it, it's such a big burden when you're in the wrong place. Your environment matters massively. And it can even be little things. Like if you're in a practice that isn't supportive and everyone's super stressed. You know, I've worked in busy London practices in like central London where they don't have enough equipment. It's bizarre when you notice your receptionists are all very, very stressed and overwhelmed and burdened with tasks. As well as your nurses, it creates this culture of like, high stress, no one's managing it very well, and everyone feels quite negative, it puts the morale down. So, you know, when you notice those things, I think it is important to to leave. And, you know, you'll be in such a great space for it. There's other jobs out there. There's other ways of also making income as well. Even if you're out of work, God forbid, a couple of months, it, it, it gives you a time to regroup, reflect, work on yourself, and, and better things will be around the corner because I agree if it's, you know, it's detrimental to your health to be in a toxic environment long term. Sure, the strain it has in mental health, which actually carries over to your physical health and, and your relationships. Every dentist I've ever spoke to, and we all have these stories, we all have friends who've been in a, what they describe as a toxic place. And, and they all just describe this. They kind of smile and they say, oh, when I left. And, and so, I'm, you know, I'm totally I, was, I didn't know where this conversation would go. I, I don't know if you had some some tools to use in that scenario to, to battle it. But I agree that it's a demon that's not even worth battling sometimes and to accept that this place, you know, it's not my vibe. It's not, it's a, I, I deserve better. And to make that difficult decision, because I think we've, it's easy to underplay that, oh yeah, just leave. I totally understand. I think we totally understand. It's such a tricky thing to do, but you have to do it for yourself. Yeah, I think it's important to just clear, get really clear as to what is successful for you. You know, what, what does success mean to you? Is it about just having a job and any job in, in that toxic workspace? Or is it about you know, what's your longer term goal? And I'm sure it probably is that you want to work in a supportive environment with a team that gets on, patients that you love, all of those aspects are going to be important. So I think once we kind of get clear as to what means success to us, you know, it might be journaling that's quite helpful for you Mm -hmm. in this process. And you just get really clear as to like, okay, what is important? And then you become also clear that actually my health, my relationships are important. My physical health, you know, my long term physical health is really, really crucial. And then it becomes a little bit easier. So Mark, like the, the whole point of this is how can we help people that we care about to to make sure they don't become a a statistic so what are the signs to look for because you know as we've alluded to sometimes it can be very easy to mask and hide and you might not know that your colleague was 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 fighting an internal battle but what are the different uh, signs to look out for so that we can be helpful to our colleagues and, and and try and give them the support that they might need 
So there are some signs that we can look out for when it comes to our colleagues, and that includes, are they, are they changing in appearance? So when we are going through mental illness, things like depression, anxiety, or suicidal thoughts, it can be quite difficult just to maintain our appearance. So if you notice that, for example, they're a bit scruffier than normal, if they were really kind of polished before, you might notice that perhaps that they're not sleeping as much as they normally do. They, or they might be sleeping more than they normally do. So if you notice like changes in their behaviours with their sleep patterns, you might also notice their eating patterns change. So if you notice, for example, they've, they're just not eating lunch anymore, they're skipping lunch, they might be losing weight, they might be gaining a lot of weight. Those are telltale uh, signs. What about someone who is, they, they used to be punctual and then they used to come at 8.30, but now they've, they're late every single day. Is that, is that something that, uh, along with the other things to consider? I've just I thought of that. Yeah, absolutely. If you've, you notice like changes in the way they show up and their energy, that's like mm. a really kind of crucial one. So just looking at their behaviours and actions Sometimes they might be withdrawn as well. So if you find out they used to be quite sociable, they'd go out and have lunch with you or they'd have a little chat with you in the middle of the day and they're just not doing that as much or they want to be by themselves, that can be a telltale as well. So the key, I think, is to not be... Don't be afraid to have conversations with your colleagues and just simply check in, you know, and yeah. talk to your colleagues and ask them, look, how is everything? I've just noticed that things seem a bit different. How are things really, you know, going? I'm here to listen and actually really listen at this point. Like a genuine, how are you rather than, hey, how are you doing? Like, yeah. like a genuine, sit there, hey, exactly. okay, yeah. let's talk. What's yeah. going so on? You You're right. Is there anything you want to share? Absolutely. So you want to take them aside, have an alone time, not like in front of everyone, and really just ask them, you know, how are things going? How are things with you? And I think that's really, really important to then mindfully listen rather than at that point say, look, I really want you to go and see a therapist. That's not going to go down well, mostly with people. It's really important to build trust. And so at that point, you just want to listen to what's going on. Be there to listen non-judgmentally as well. And don't give what we call glip advice, which is pull your socks together, you'll be fine. Like just don't don't say any of that. Just just listen, right? Be there, show compassion, kindness, and friendship to your colleague. And then if you find that you know you've had these conversations and you've built that trust you can then also if you do find that that person has shared that they are experiencing suicidal thoughts you can then signpost them to seek help and i think that's really really important don't be afraid to go and help you know your friend so it might be that you speak to NHS practitioners health support you might speak to the other charities confidential dental health support trust those are the dental specific ones that can be quite useful and I myself have used for other colleagues I have uh, spoken to Rory at dental health support trust and then Lauren at confidential and they will then signpost your colleague to the right person it's really important if someone is suicidal what we mean by suicidal is not just having thoughts of suicide, but you've got a plan, what we call suicidal ideation. You've got a plan to commit suicide. So if your colleague tells you, I have a plan, you, you don't have to keep that in. I think it's really, really important to then pass that knowledge so that they can be safely looked after. It's a, it's a bit like when you're safeguarding a child and Absolutely. there are certain things that, you, you, most things you need to get consent. Okay, I'm a little bit concerned. Yeah. Can I speak to them? And then, then they can, they're allowed to say no. But there are certain submissions where you don't have to get the patient, the parent's consent to, yeah. to seek help because it's in the child's best interest. Yeah. Absolutely. So in that situation, I think it's really, really crucial. So if someone has given you that information, I think it's really important to pass that on. And often, you know, if they have shared it with you, they might subconsciously want help, but they don't know how to ask for help. You can also say to your colleague at any point, look, how can I support you? You know, can I actually organise a call to the GP? Can I organise this call? Or can I take something because off your at the, plate? Because at that point, you know, people may think, oh, but how, you know, are, you, are you crossing a line? But at that point, they've already admitted to you the ideation mm. aspect of mm. it. And then they, they, they trust you enough that they've told you something uh, like that. And therefore, that's kind of broken a barrier that allows you to hopefully assist them. 
Absolutely, yeah. I think it's really, really important at that point to to do that. And then, like I said, even it might be that, you know, your colleague isn't suicidal, but they're just really struggling. They might be experiencing some signs of, of depression and they just don't really know what to do. You can literally say to them, say to your colleague, look, how can I support you? Is there anything I can take off your plate? Do you want me to help you with groceries or like, what can I do? And then... Even just maybe, oh, I noticed that you're, you're running a bit late today. Can I see your next mm-hmm. patient? Just maybe have a, have a go, have a cup of tea, just like little things like that to show uh, that, hey, you're in it to help, help them maybe. Yes, absolutely. Any ways, any acts of kindness, like that's really, really important. And, and then when you do have that trust, you can share those resources, right? Because actually a lot of dental professionals aren't aware that there are dental specific places they can go and they might not feel comfortable going to the GP which is where these charities are really really useful and so just sharing that's going to be really really powerful. Thank you I'm going to put all those uh, links in the show notes so that God forbid anyone needs to, to signpost anyone, but is there you know, for, for when we need it. And it also helps to improve the algorithm for the search engine optimization, all that kind of stuff is, is really important. And I, I mean, Marek, I'm all about your fulfillment of dentistry. You know, if you're in a toxic place, sometimes it is that your patients are nice, but it's toxic environment, mm-hmm. but the patients are nice, or it's a toxic environment, but I get all the toys to play with. And that's important as well. Mm-hmm. But for, for the fulfillment from your clinical dentistry, which is what I'm all about, right? You're enjoying the, the, the actual minutia of daily dentistry. That's going to be much more enhanced when everything around you, the environment around you is, is much more supportive. I've really enjoyed today's chat, Mark, because you've given really great tools and you covered that really dark and, and, and unfair on you topic of suicide. But I, I felt like you gave such great things that we can reflect on as a profession and maybe you'll reach higher up positions that people can think, you know what, that episode, Mark's right. Let's, why don't we, one, maybe, maybe Kings, right? Your alma mater will say, you know what, let's tribute this. Let's have a, um, a, a module in there about resilience. You never know, right? This, these are things that could, could spiral into something beautiful how can people find out more about my ninja how can they connect with you tell us all your social media because i i, I really want people who, who need that kind of daily training and who, who think be and i think everyone should to look after themselves in this way how can they find you so i'm on instagram mind ninja dot wellbeing but you can also find me on my website so mind little dash ninja dot co dot uk i've got free resources on there as well and I've got uh, the Mind Flossing Toolkit as well as the Resilience and Wellbeing for Dental Professionals book. So, I yeah, love the name Mind Flossing. It's so good. Oh, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I just for me, like my, I think one of my strengths is creativity and fun. So I try and, do, you know, in terms of the illustrations and making things engaging, even the workshops, I've got Lego in it. You know, I try and make things as engaging and fun as, as I can. So, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that resonates with you. It totally does. And I'm going to put all of this in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening, everyone, to, to the end. And Marek, thanks so much for, for, for sharing all these wonderful things. Uh, and I really do think we've helped some people today, which is what it's all about. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jazz. It's been lovely to be on. Well, there we have it, guys. Thank you so, so much for listening all the way to the end. I'm hoping some of these themes are really going to help you. If you're ever in a dark place or you will enter a dark place in life, I'm hoping you can always come back to this to find some practical help. And actually, if you need the next step, I would totally reach out to Maruk. She's doing some wonderful things. She's got some cool toolkits and we're doing a little giveaway as well. So do check out our Instagram at Protrusive Dental, where I will be tagging Maruk as well. And if you can think of anyone who might need this episode, please, please share it with them, right? Share it in your socials because you never know how how badly someone might need this reminder of the importance of mental health and looking after it, not just at crisis point, but on a daily, weekly, and a monthly basis. And remember, the next time you get that tight feeling in your tummy, don't stress. Just like Lorenzo taught us right at the beginning. Now, this episode is eligible for CPD. It's on protrusive guidance. So if you're on one of the paid plans on protrusive guidance, you just have to answer a few questions and get your CPD. This type of CPD is rare. You know, we talk about all the you know DME and onlays and extractions, but this is also really important CPD. This is what guarantees longevity of your career. Your mindset is more important than your skill set. So thank you again, Patricia Rati. I'll catch you same time, same place next week. Bye for now.